Hello, everyone. You're listening to the Paradigm Shifts podcast with your host, Keisha Kruger. I'm an organization development practitioner and executive coach working with leaders to create positive changes in the workplace using behavioral science. My personal mission, share science-based tools and leadership insights from the field that you can use in the workplace and beyond. Considering we spend about three quarters of our lifetime at work, there is incredible science and organizational psychology that could be used to rethink the way we work, lead, and ultimately live. Join me as I speak with thought leaders and business leaders in practice, unpacking light bulb moments for paradigm shifts. Hello, everyone. On this week's episode, we chat with Tim Buick, an author, speaker, podcaster, professional coach, MC, and announcer at the Tim Buick Company. He is the author of the book Blase to a Blaze, How to Turn Your Blahs into Oz to Ignite Passion and Purpose. A painful series of personal and professional setbacks motivated him to create the M5 Method of Self-Discovery, a systematic process to help the reader rise above any obstacle. But before we get into the episode, I'd like to share that we are closing in on the end of season one, which is one more episode to go. Season two will be back this fall with even more incredible guests, topics, and meaningful science about the world of work you don't want to miss. So if you haven't already, hit that subscribe button wherever you stream podcasts so you get the alerts when our first episode of season two kicks off. Thank you so much for joining in on this first season and this journey. I'll see you back next season. Hello, Tim. How are you? I am doing great. How are you, Keisha? Fantastic. And thank you so much for being here. It's an honor. It's an honor. I've been looking forward to this. We've been trading emails back and forth for quite some time and rescheduled a couple times. So I'm stoked, pumped, and amped to be with you today. Yes, we have. And we just learned as we were chatting before we hit the record button that we are actually neighbors recording just probably down the street from each other so how fascinating is that definitely not planned (laughs) no not at all i was saying boy we should have gotten together at a coffee shop in in uptown matthews north carolina and and hung out there it's like I, i can't believe you're so close you're almost a bike ride away from where i am That's insane. I would have never guessed that that would have happened. But today, we are going to chat about a story. Um, You have a story to share with us about personal transformation and your process with facing adversity. And you talk about it in your book. Your book is Blase to a Blaze. Is that correct? Correct. Yes. How to turn your blase into Oz to ignite passion and purpose would be the subtitle. I love that. I love that. So tell us, how did you get to writing that book? Like what led you there? What was the story behind that? Well, I would say as I reflect on this, that it started with one seminal moment that turned into three. And so key moment number one is when I left the company that I had worked for for nearly 30 years and transitioned out of that in March of 2018. And so almost immediately, I thought, and as I reflected, I said, nearly three decades I've, I've worked for and with this company, and it's been a, a banner that I have held high and done so proudly. And, and now it was off to someplace else, which I didn't know what that someplace else would be or where it would be. And so I asked myself the question simply, well, now what? And how do I figure out the now what? And it wasn't too long after that, that I was driving along, I think here on the roads of Charlotte, North Carolina, and I saw a bumper sticker that simply said, whatever. And I'm stopped at this stoplight thinking, what would cause a person to put a bumper sticker that says whatever on their car? And the more I thought about it, the more fired up I got, because I thought, this is your one and only life. There's no dress rehearsals. This is our one shot at life. And am I going to go through life with the attitude, whatever? Oh, no, it should be whatever it takes. And I got more and more fired up. I think I was starting to follow this guy as I was thinking about it. And I'm going, no, it's not whatever. It's whatever it takes. So back to the question of what would cause someone to put that bumper sticker 
on their car. And I started to think about the general apathy, another word is blasé, that people have about life. They go, well, whatever, I just don't care. And it really struck me and it, and it drove me to research what would cause people to have a generally ap apathetic view of life and an approach to life. And the two are related because as I was asking myself the now what question, I was thinking at the same time of a lot of people seem to be not even asking that question. They just drift through life as opposed to doing it by design. So this book started as a career transition, jobs transition, life transition book. And I thought it was finished. And that would have been about 18 months ago. I thought the book was done. Then I went for my regular physical. And my general physician said, Tim, he pulled me over into a side room. He said, your heart sounds really bad. He says, I don't want you to leave the building until you schedule an appointment with your cardiologist. He said, it, I'm, I'm very concerned about it. And so I scheduled that appointment. Now, I had a known mitral valve disease, you know, leaky valve in there that had been a condition that was discovered some 11, 12 years ago. So I'll, I'll try to keep this short, is that I met with the cardiologist. He says, Tim, you're adapting to this really well. One of the many things I do is I'm director of paddle sports at Old Providence Racquet Club here in Charlotte, North Carolina, and I teach pickleball and platform tennis, and I play a lot, so I'm, I'm extremely active. And I was, what I thought, fine. He says, you've been compensating really well, but I want to take a closer look. He scheduled a appointment with a surgeon to talk about it, and he said, Tim, we've done these tests more blood is backing up into your heart than it's being pushed out. And he says, because you're in good shape, you've been compensating for it, but this is not a good long-term plan. We're going to need to do open heart surgery. And he says, I think we can go through the side and repair this heart. Well, as it turns out, I had subsequent testing after I did what's called a heart cath, where they run a, a camera up through your arm into your heart. The technology is mind blowing. While I was in recovery, my surgeon calls and says, hey, Tim, I have bad news. Now, that's not a phone call that you want. And he says there is 75 to 85 percent blockage in all three chambers of your heart. Not only do we need to do a valve repair, but we need to do a triple bypass. So we're going to need to cut your chest open, and this is going to be a major surgery. And so I tell that story because Blase to a Blaze was not just about transitioning from one job to another, one career to another. It's more of a life purpose book of why are we here? And, and it, I had to rewrite significant portions of the book to include my journey up to and through open heart surgery, because the, the, the key question is why are we here? And when we figure out that why question, then what do we do about it? Uh, wow. Wow, wow, wow. <laughs> so I just want to go back to the first question that you asked when you originally had written your book, You, when it was originally intended for that career transition, that life transition, you were asking yourself and surfacing this reflection question, now what? And I think lots of people can find themselves there, right? So it's fairly relatable. But then to have some adversity in your life that pivots that question to not now what, but why am I here? And what can I do about that? And what do I do with the time that I have while I'm here? Huge, huge paradigm shift, if, if you will. Exactly. So how does it someone is. face adversity when when adversity keeps on coming? That's a great question. And it's a question that all of us have to face. I had no idea mm. the amount of adversity that I would have to face back in March 2018. And that was shortly after the loss of my mom and now the, the loss of my job. And then there were family issues and and death in the family and friends and 
a host of other issues that I, I never expected that were more difficult, frankly, than open heart surgery. And, and so I look, and, and the key point, and I, I mentioned it in the book, is I've had people say, boy, open heart surgery must have really changed your perspective on life. And I say, no, actually it doesn't. I have the same approach to life that I did before open heart surgery. What changed was the urgency of, we shared a story you know, before we came on air, so to speak, about the loss of your father at a young age. And we don't know how much time we have left. We only have statistically 28,809 days to live, statistically. Now, if you back hmm. into that and you you subtract the number of days you already have lived, that can be a very sobering thought of, I don't have a lot of time left. Now, you've got more days statistically than I do, but we don't know. So that was really the essence of, of the creation of the book and the urgency of it is what we're going to talk about today is so important because in my view, it speaks directly to the passion and the purpose of living out. So we do that in the workplace. We do that outside of the workplace. And so when you're talking about overcome adverse, uh, overcoming adversity, the way that I would answer that is that when we know our why, the how becomes easier. Oh. <laughs> what most people don't do, because frankly, it can be scary, is to have that deep down self-reflection, honest assessment of your life and realize this is where I am at this moment. So now what, mm. what am I going to do with it? So and if we know who we are, then it's a lot easier to know where we're going. Mm. We talk a lot about this on my podcast and it's just like the crux of everything is that self-awareness. If you don't know who you are, then how can you ask yourself these questions, um, you know, of of our why and 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 get to the 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 big 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 north star question of what we're doing here on this planet? What do you think prevents people from having that inner reflective dialogue with themselves? Is it an avoidance of? some sort of fear or is it ego related? Where do you think that's coming from? That's the first thing I was going to say to answer that question was the word you use fear. I think so either consciously or subconsciously. Do I really want to know who I am at my core and what am I going to think of me when I learn this? You know, maybe I don't mm -hmm. like myself. And I think sometimes, and, and sometimes it may not go that deep. It, it truly could stay in the subconscious level. And we go through life by drift, not design. And so we go to, I, I know for me, I went to high school and it wasn't even a question of whether I would go to college. It was just assumed. So I went to college. It would be assuming that I would graduate. I graduated. It would be assumed that I would then get a job. And then I just keep going through and I never really took a deep dive in saying, but is this what I should be doing? Is this what I'm gifted to do? Is this what my purpose is? I never really took that deep dive. And so I found myself just moving to where the opportunity is. Much like a river. A river goes to the path of least resistance. And I think much of life is that way of going, whoa, this door opened. And I've had opportunities present themselves and I go, oh, that's got a big title. I kind of like what they're talking in terms of compensation. I'm very interested in this. Okay. Should I be doing that? And will I be good at that? And so by, um, by way of answering your question, two things that I think are critically important that I outline in the book. One is to develop a personal mission and purpose statement. This is for your life. Now, a lot of businesses do this, of course. Here's our mission. Here's our purpose. This is what we do. We want to, want to get these products to solve this problem in the marketplace for our targeted customer. Have we done that for our personal life? For so ourselves. what is your mm -hmm. personal purpose and mission statement? Do you have one? Do I have one? And, 
And so it, it on the surface sounds like, well, yeah, I could write something out. But boy, when you drill down to it, it's not easy. So would you like me to share <laughs> mine? Please, 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 please. All right. So my PMP statement, my personal mission and purpose statement is this, to leave footprints on another person's heart by creating stick to your ribs type moments infused with light, laughter, and love. That now, has you my... written all over it, Tim. <laughs> all over it. <laughs> this is... it. It does. And it. I arrived to that statement through much blood, sweat, and tears of saying, so, so how do I get to that? So how do I write my personal mission and purpose statement? And mm -hmm. we have to know who we are. So as, as I go through that and I go through the process of how to write this statement, I came up with what I call the ablazon equation. Okay? So it's my passionate belief that if we get this equation right and we answer it the way that we're uniquely wired, see, so often we live our lives according to someone else's set of expectations or beliefs, or mom or dad always wanted me to do this, or I should, they told me <laughs> I should be a lawyer or this type of things or whatever it might be. So that's what I do. And guess what? I'm miserable. I just was I had dinner a couple of nights ago with someone like that and go, no, I was miserable as a lawyer. Because I, I, that's not how I was designed, but that was the expectation of my parents. So back to the ablazon equation, which is this. Passion, which is what I have, plus prowess, what I do, multiplied by purpose, why I do, plus problem, what I solve. We get that right, we will have the ablazon life. So passion plus prowess multiplied by purpose and problem. And if we hit on those cylinders in each one of those four elements, we're going to be not only doing what we're good at, because we can go out and do things that we're good at, but that may not be my passion. I don't care about it. It may not be my mm -hmm. purpose of why I do things. It may not even be solving a problem in the world. I, I use an example in the book. I used to, as a little pup, love to catch butterflies. I just, I, it was kind of our thing. And we, I, one of my favorite books growing up was Butterflies and Moths. And I had that thing memorized. I was more of a butterfly guy and not a moth guy. Okay, not exactly the mm -hmm. most macho type of hobby, but I loved doing it. I had a passion for it. I was good at it. I knew how to anticipate where the, the butterflies were at certain times of the day and everything. So I said, all right, is it my purpose in life to be a butterfly catcher? And then, I, <laughs> you know, if I take myself through this and I say, what is the problem I'm solving? And can I make some money? Uh, can I have a sustainable life of that? Um, no, that stays in the realm <laughs> of hobby. So uh, that uh, I perhaps got a touch <laughs> off track on that. But that's that's part of how you figure out. So now what is by going through and figuring out that ablazon equation? I love that you broke that down for us. And also you added that bonus there by differentiating between a passion and a hobby, because I can imagine some people getting caught up in that, right? It's like, oh, I, I found this thing that I'm like, I really um, am really excited about and I'm good at it, but does it serve a purpose or solve a problem? And is it sustainable? Um, so I love that you were able to break that down. There were two things you said. You said, one, you develop a personal mission purpose statement. What was the second thing in your book that you were going to refer to? Well, and, and I did. I rolled into number two without identifying it, which is the ablazon equation. And, and per so perfect. When I've, got, when I've got those two elements down, and, and especially Listen. with that personal purpose and mission statement, all right? So, so when I get that down, as an example... I was approached last year about the potential of running a business. And I'm, I, I went through the process and had some discussions and I was excited about it. I, I thought this could be right in the sweet spot. And mm -hmm. then the conversations evolved into perhaps some other elements of what that would be. If I put it through that lens of my personal mission and purpose statement, it helps me to 
say yes to some things and no to other things. I call it having guardrails on your nice. life. And so I could be approached to do something. Quick example. I got back Wednesday night. So as we record this uh, two nights ago, uh, I got back from the Minto U.S. Open Pickleball Championships in Naples, Florida. And had an opportunity there. Uh, the good folks at Total Pickleball brought me down and to to shoot instructional content videos for for YouTube and their website and uh, a great group of people. And I was subsequently asked to provide the live commentary for the Pickleball channel for one of the afternoon matches. And so I, I spent the day on Tuesday uh, with the good folks at the Pickleball channel. So I go on and say, all right, wait a second. Does this fit my PMP statement? doing these things, creating mm. content, because pickleball wasn't, I mean, as I left uh, my previous company, it wasn't like, I know what I want to do. I want to do pickleball. I had never even played pickleball yeah. at that point. Okay. In fact, I was one of the guys that would make fun of that stupid sport with a little wiffle ball and the light paddles. Now, now I teach and now I do live commentary. Now I do instructional videos, which is how, how's that for expecting the unexpected. Uh, but, it, it, but in putting it through my personal mission and purpose statement to leave footprints on another person's heart by creating stick to your ribs type moments infused with light, laughter, and love. In doing those things, can I fulfill that PMP? Yeah. So I'm going to do it. And that's where it helped. Beautiful. Beautiful, beautiful. So the guardrails, let's talk about that for a moment because there's something that you had mentioned, which is how to know between saying yes and no to different opportunities. And you're saying what I'm hearing you say is using this blaze in the equation will help you determine the things that you should be saying yes and should be saying no to. Is that correct? Correct. And there are a couple elements to this. One is professional and the other is personal. So as an example on the personal side, at some point, I want to become a competent golfer. A lot of my good friends are good golfers. It's not a passion. And you know what? At this point, it certainly has not been a prowess. It doesn't, it doesn't meet my purpose in any sort of way. And I'm not solving anyone's problems. It's a hobby. But at some point, I want to spend some time to be a competent golfer because I like hanging out with the guys and I don't want to embarrass myself. And I'm, I'm, a natural racket sports guy. I've played it my whole life. I'm competent on the court in a variety of sports. And I tell my students, everything I teach in racket sports, I violate in golf. I don't practice. I've taken one lesson in my life. My stroke sucks. I have the wrong grip. And my game is a disaster unless I get lucky. So I need to practice those things. But that, that doesn't fit into my PMP statement or the ablazing equation. That doesn't mean I shouldn't do it. It can be a hobby. Now, professionally, that's a different deal. So I think a lot of people, to answer your question, I think, unfortunately, far too many people in the workplace are miserable because they haven't gone through this process. They're doing something that they're not meant to do they're doing something that they might not be good at. They have no purpose in doing it, no personal drive, and they're miserable. All they're doing is they're a slave to the paycheck. And that does not create an ablazing life. That causes you to become blasé. So that's the importance and the critical importance of work on yourself first. I believe it was Jim Rohn, the great motivational speaker, who said, work harder on yourself than you do on your job. Yes, and sir. that is so yes, true because when we do that, we will do a better job in our jobs, in our career, in our profession, in our personal world, in our family and community. Yeah. And it's not too late to, like, if you find yourself listening to this and you're like, oh, you're right. I feel called out, Tim. I feel I feel personally insulted. I am doing a job I'm miserable at. I'm not loving it. It's not too late to pivot no matter how long you've spent in a career or a company or a job, right? It's never too late. One of the exciting things mm -hmm. about, being, about being down in Naples was seeing the age of some of these players competing at the U.S. Open. And I'm and they are feisty. They're fighting. They're ha they have their community. 
they are doing what they love. They they are hitting this ablaze equation, and and they're living life fulfilled and happy and with with a greater sense of purpose through the the world's fastest growing sport, or at least the U.S. fastest growing sport of pickleball. Now, I'm not here to sell pickleball by any means. I like the sport. I wouldn't say I'm addicted to it like other people are, but I enjoy it, and it's provided a lot for me and given me a lot of enjoyment. So that's the key. Is again, I keep coming back to. As Socrates said, know thyself. And so that's what I do through this book is try to help people to know thyself. Know thyself. I love that because at the premise of all of this information that you're sharing with us and all of this knowledge to be even able to take that first step and develop your PMP, your personal mission and purpose statement, you have to know yourself. And for those who are, um, quote unquote, fearful of getting into that work and that reflection process, I, there's a quote, and I don't know who said it. It's out there, though. I do know it exists. It's wherever you go, there you are. Um, you will always have you. And it, it doesn't matter where you go, whether you're work or you're in personal life, you are always going to show up um, in your spaces. And so the best thing you can do for yourself to have the best, most optimized, maximized life and actualized life is to know yourself and to be able to understand yourself on a deep level. So Tim, how do we discover ourselves? I think you have a method that you talk about in your book. Is that right? Yes, I did. Well, you, you offer that up. That's like an alley-oop in basketball. I go, yes, I, a matter of fact, I do. It's the M5 <laughs> method. Yes. Yeah, so, so we can talk Amazing. about that in, in talking. I'll, I'll just say one thing succinctly before we, we get to the M5 method. In, in looking at when you say the best thing you can do for yourself is, is to show up and be the best version of yourself. Not only do you do that for yourself, but you do it for everyone mm. around you. And, and so yeah. everyone benefits. So this isn't a selfish inve invention here. This isn't a selfish endeavor by going through and doing a mm -hmm. deep dive within yourself. You're doing that, hopefully the purpose of not only for you to have an ablazing life, but also to lighten the world around for everyone. And, and that's really the key thing. So a good way to look at this is you, you say, look within and, and find out mm -hmm. what you see. Then look without when you've got a close group of friends, what do they see in you? And this is part of the self-discovery of close. And this is a very tight knit group, someone that will give you honest feedback that you trust and say, here's what I see in myself. Does that resonate with you or am I missing something? Because we all have blind spots. And then lastly, we look around. What does the world need? Okay, so I, I know who hmm. I am. How can I attach my unique gift mix, my unique passion, my unique purpose, and then how can I attach it to problems and people around me to have positive impact? And that's where not only the compensation comes from monetarily, but but also in a way that we can have lasting legacy by saying mm. there, there's few things that are a greater joy of being able to do something regularly that you're meant to do, that you're really good at and that you love. To do. And that's what this is all about. So let's get in. You want to get into the M5 method? All right, I'll go through it. Yes, I'm excited. Quickly. Thank you. Okay, yeah. so so here we go. It's a five-step process, hence the name M5. Okay. And guess what? The M, the M words all begin with that letter. It's remarkable. So M1 is so mirror, okay? And the foundational oh, okay. question is, who do I want to be? So M1 is mirror. So I'm looking in the mirror. Who do I want to be? And I take the reader or the listener to the audiobook through the process of identify an aspirational model. So I look and I say, okay, I want to be, since this is fresh in my mind, I want to be a professional pickleball player. Okay, there were some high-level pros there. I go, I really like the way that guy plays. I really like the way that gal plays. Okay, what is she doing that I'm not good at? How did she get there? How does she practice? What is she, you know, so I can, it's students. So who's my ap aspirational model or models? Secondly, M2 is malaise. This is 
perhaps the unfun part of the book, because I take the reader through the acronym BLASE, okay, which is bored, lonely, ailing, stuck, and exhausted. So the foundational question to M2 malaise is why am I not that person now? What are the barriers that are mm. keeping me from who I should be, who I want to be? Something's blocking me. What are those? And so I go through those five identifiers as a framework of saying, okay, maybe it's one of those five factors or a combination of all five that is keeping me from being all I can be. M3 is mode. Check it. M3 is mine. So this is the deep dive that we were talking about. M3 is mine. The foundational question is, who am I? Okay. So then we go through an entire process of, I use the acronym FLAME. Okay. And, and so I've got a lot of acronyms. I've got the acronym of BLASE and now this acronym, which is FLAME. So one is mm -hmm. the F is find your spark. Okay. So going through everything and saying, what are those things in life that really get you excited? Get the heart rate up and that go light you up. Exactly. You know, it's one of those, like the classic question, if money and time were no object, what would you do with your time? So it's those things is just list everything that, you know, find your spark. Okay. Secondly, list your wins. And I use wins loosely. List everything that not only medals and trophies, but everything where someone came back and said, you were really good at that. I run a kindergarten class and the kids were just activated. The parents are happy. And so everything which you would consider a success. So list your wins. Third, the A in flame is ask others. So again, that's looking without, okay, outside of ourself and say, you know what, I, I think I'm kind of good at this, this, and this, and I, I've, I've gotten positive feedback, um, but what do you think? And as, as an aside, one of my very closest friends just passed away two days ago. Uh, I'm sorry. I love the wow. man. He was a, a pastor in Kansas City, Missouri, one of the very few people that I could connect with on every level from just sheer jocularity to the deepest of issues. And we would laugh and had so just, he is a beautiful man and uh, I'm going to miss him dearly. And he said something to me that always stuck with me. I, I did some speaking and he came up to me and um, he said, so what do you think? I said, I, I said, I enjoyed it. It was a lot of work for preparing the message and all that. And he says, Tim, let me tell you something. He said, what's even more important than what you like is what others see in you. Because a lot of times we can't see it in ourselves. And he told me, he says, Tim, you're a gifted speaker. You're a gifted communicator. Other people are, are talking about this message continually. He said, follow that. Follow that. If, you, if that's a passion of yours, follow that. And that always stuck with me. Okay. So a lot of times... Again, that's the mirror there where we're looking and saying, what are other people saying about me? The M in flame is magnify your strengths. So once we go through this process, and we often hear it says, you know, you work on your weaknesses. No, no. That's like me going out and practicing golf seven hours a day. For what? No, that's it. Yeah, that, that's like me, you know, putting a, putting a, oh, let's say an online course about how to build pretty spreadsheets. Oh, I'm horrible at that. I should. So I need to magnify my strengths. So lean into those things that I do well. And I, as I tell people, I tell people, I said, I have very few positive qualities, but I can speak and I can write. I'm a communicator. I should stick to that because I'm really not very good in a lot of this other stuff. Uh, we talked a little bit about that off air, about that, of uh, me trying to do everything to produce the podcast when I should farm it out to others. Okay? So mm -hmm. yeah, it's, it's magnify your strengths and get for your weaknesses, find support. 
offload those mm-hmm. somewhere. And then uh, it's establish your purpose. We talked about the purpose and mission statement there. So that's the Perfect. M3, which is mine. And I spent a little extra time on that because as we talked about, that's so, so critical. Is once we find that's out it. who we are, then it's so much easier to figure out where we're going. And then quickly now, so we don't go too long, M4 is mode. The foundational question in mode is where do I want to go? So I use the acronym FIRE. So we've got blase, then flame. Now we're going to turn the flame into a fire. And the F in fire is to fan that flame. So what we want to do is make a list of everything that we love doing that is within our gift mix. Not just everything that we love, but what are the things that we love doing that we're also good at? Good at. And it's mm-hmm. a difference. Yes. And it's a difference. Like I could love to play guitar. No one else would love to listen to it. So that's something I can mm-hmm. lock myself into my podcast studio and just do that. Okay. But that's uh, not what we're talking about here on a professional basis. Okay. And then the I in fire is the intersection of loves and skills. So we figure out Oof. what do we love? What are we also good at? And what are those areas, careers, jobs, opportunities? It could be volunteer positions. Where does that intersection between skills and loves? And that's really critical because I could love something, but then there's no need in the greater world for it. Or there's need in the greater world, but I don't love it. And I think a lot of people mm-hmm. are stuck in that job where, yeah, where they're doing I things because, yeah, they're they're solving a problem, uh, but they're not passionate about it and they may not be gifted. Not a problem they want to solve it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Somebody else is better at that than others. You know. So, And then the E in, well, and I'll just say very quickly, the E in fire is enlist your army. This is the easiest part of all, okay, is enlist your army. So go through your network. Everybody you know, everybody that's in your phone, on social channels, who'd you go to high school with, college, enlist your army and say, this is the direction that I, I want to lead in my life. Who do you know that I should know that I could talk to about this? And a lot of times when we enlist our army, we go through and I said, so Fesha, I, I could meet you and maybe you're not really going to help me with, oh, I want to increase speaking gigs or write another book or something. But you may say, Tim, I know someone you need to talk to. So enlist your mm-hmm. army. It's, it's networking 101. Connecting. Yeah. Right. You were going to ask me a question as I rattled on. Yes. Um, I wasn't sure if I got the R in fire. So I was just <clears throat> curious if I got that one. Okay, so did I left out the R? Oh, I think, I believe I did. Research the requirements. So the R. Research, I apologize. Okay. Yes, research no the requirements. So again, with fire is fan your flame. The I is intersection of skills and love. The R is research the requirements. What does it take for me to do this? So say that I want to be a professor at a university. And I go, you know what? I have the academic chops. I have the interest in the subject matter. I love the the college community, the college life and seeing campus. So now I need to research the requirements. What do I need to do in order to be a professor at a university? What are the degrees that I need? What are the classes I need to take? That type of thing. And then the E is in Western Army. Perfect. I got it. Nice. All right. Very good. So I, think I we're apologize. At fifth, we're at the yes. fifth M then. Awesome. Okay. So M5 is maintained. Maintain. With the foundational question, how do I keep the fire burning? Now, I believe, oh. according to word count, 39% of the book is on M5. And the reason why is those previous M's, there are other works out there. And what color is your parachute? There's a lot of resources out there for people to do a deep dive in some of those other M's. So I wanted to make sure to have an umbrella covering of where we're going but the key to it all is m5 how do we keep the fire burning and i look and i uh, i'm a news guy i i come out of the news business i used to be a news anchor sports anchor worked in television and radio i loved it 
and I was a news junkie. And it wasn't all that long ago that being a news junkie like I am, I realized it was affecting my psyche. Things mm. have gotten so caustic, so polarized, so nasty, regardless of what side of the aisle you are on politically or culturally. It has, we, there's a mean spiritedness going on in our culture that is disturbing. And I found that the more I watched and consumed and read the news and debated cultural issues, the more miserable I became. And, and I realized, you know what? If I want to keep the fire burning, I need to, I need to be on a diet. That's what I have for my own <laughs> health. I need to be on a news diet. And so what are those things that can help us to keep the fire burning? And that is a blaze. And the foundational point is the A in a blaze, which is appreciation. It's yeah. very difficult to be down and depressed and cynical and bitter if we start every single day with appreciation. There are things that are going on in my life that I don't want to be happening, that I don't understand, that I struggle with, that are emotionally heavy. But if I start every day with appreciation, I have a lot to be thankful for. I'm thankful for the time that we have together. I'm thankful that we had a chance to meet through a, a mutual friend. And I go, this is, this is great. I'm enjoying this time together with you. I say, Me I want to show that appreciation. And if we do mm -hmm. that, having an attitude of gratitude each day, then mm -hmm. that will help us to keep the fire burning because we all have elements to be thankful for. I tell people, you know, they say, well, Tim, I had, you know, this open heart surgery some 16 months ago. And I said, they say, Tim, well, how are you doing? I said, well, I'm above ground and I'm upright. Those are, those are two good things, you know? And, and, and so I'm thankful that I have the energy and ability and I'm relatively plain, pain free in order to have this conversation with you. So it begins with appreciation. The B in a blaze is boldness. Now, boldness is an attitude. So it is courage in the face of fear. And so by having an attitude of boldness, it's going forward now that we've done the deep dive the mine, okay, the M3 and the M5 method of self-discovery, we've gone through that. Now we need to be bold and do what we know we must do to do what we know we should do. And boldness could be very simple. It could be having that difficult conversation that we've been putting off, that we keep sweeping under the rug. It could be walking across the street to talk to a neighbor that you had some sort of dispute with and just saying, you know, I need to fix this. So, so boldness is an attitude. The L in a blaze is laughter. We have to laugh. I love to laugh. Yeah. I love to make people we have laugh. To. And so how do we do that? It's a shame that statistics and studies continually go out that, that kids laugh some 87% more of the time than, than adults do. That the older we get, the less we laugh. No, no. I look and I say, wait a second. I got a lot of life in my rearview mirror. I look behind mm -hmm. me and I go, oh my gosh, that's hilarious. Could you believe I did all that stuff? You know, and, and there's so much that we can laugh. We can laugh at ourselves. We can laugh at circumstances. Laughter is an essential. And I go through and, and physically and psychologically, laughter has many benefits that I won't go into here, but I go into it in the book. The second A in a blaze is action. So where B is boldness, A is action. So boldness is an attitude. Action is movement, physicality. It's making progress, taking that step. I believe it was a small little company that had a tagline, just do it. It still resonates, you know, of just do it. Go out and do it. I saw a lot of that this week in Naples, Florida, you know, at the U.S. Open Pickleball Championships of people going out. So many people have come up to me and said, Tim, I've never played a sport before. I was sedentary. I had no social circles. And I, I came across this sport and now I'm playing tournaments. They took the action, the boldness with the attitude 
and then the action to actually do it. The Z in a blaze is zest. So go through it. Now, zest isn't necessarily, now, I've been told I have a, a zestful personality. Yeah, I'm a passionate guy, and I'm an expressive, and I'm an emotional person. This isn't a personality. This is an approach. Mm -hmm. So by going for it with zest, it's one of the reasons I love being around ski resorts, as an example. Here in Charlotte, I make this joke all the time. Sorry, Charlotte people that are listening and watching this. Whining about the weather all the time. And it's like, oh, if it's a little too cold or a little too hot or the wind's blowing, it's like, oh, my gosh. Well, I grew up in the Chicago area. Oh, I mean, we had to put a space heater like on the engine to get a car started so we could go to school or to work or that type of thing. And and what I like and the reason why I mentioned zestfulness is you see this in a lot of outdoors men and women is that mm -hmm. there's a zestfulness of it doesn't matter what the elements are. I'm going to go mm -hmm. out and do it. I'm going to go do it with passion. And it's an attitude we can have whether we're in the accounting office and going, you know what, mm -hmm. I'm going to I'm going to crush this. I need to, to bang out these numbers. So. It, again, that is something that's approached. Be around other zesters. And finally, the E is expectation. This is a biggie. Expectation. Do we expect the good or do we expect the bad? And there are two different types of expectation. One expectation is the expectation of outcome and the other expectation is the expectation of attitude. It's a disposition. And, and the difference between the two is I could expect that I'm going to make X amount this year and I'm tied to that expectation. Then I'm disappointed if I didn't hit that compensation level or that. But there's also the expectation that all things work for the good. And that's the expectation that I'm talking about is I have a knack for if my flight is diverted and then I go through, I just expect I'm going to be able to figure it out and get that last flight out. Now, it doesn't happen all the time, but I think by having that attitude of expectation, things have a tendency to work out for you if you expect the good, but it's the same yes, with the bad. If I wake up in the morning and I go, this day is going to suck. Well, guess what? Mm -hmm. I'm going to start doing things that are going to affirm my expectation because we don't like to have cognitive dissonance. We don't like to hold two opposing thoughts in our brain. Okay. So if I expect the bad, guess what? We have a tendency to think that's what's going to happen and that's what we bring into our life. But conversely, we expect the good, we bring good things into our life. Thank you for sharing the M5 step and to self-discovery because that is wow i mean we're talking about really doing the work here and that's so needed for everyone that's listening to really think through how can i in a really practical tangible way take this work break it down and do step by step and one of the things that i am reflecting on while i'm listening to you break out the way to the m5 right how to maintain how do i keep the fire burning um, the thing that stands out to me the most is that everything is around perspective, mindset, approach, belief systems. And the first thing that you had said was around appreciation. And we're all about surfacing science here. So I'm aware of some science as it relates to gratitude and having a practice of uh, gratitude that's so exponentially powerful and impactful to your mental health. So whether you're struggling with depression anxiety, or just having a more negative mindset overall, right? You have more of an external locus of control. You you believe things are happening to you, not for you. Having and incorporating a practice of gratitude or appreciation, as you say, whether it's in the morning or before you go to bed, is so critical to your mindset and can really have a significant impact. Um, I'll just share this study that I'm um, familiar with. Or it involved about 300 adults and they put the participants in the three groups and they were all receiving counseling services, right? But that first group, they were instructed, they had some instructions to write a letter of gratitude and um, they had to do it to the other, another person for about three weeks, one letter of gratitude for three weeks. 
And the second group, they were asked to really write down and journal their deepest thoughts, but it was around negative experiences. And then that third group didn't do any writing activity. And what they found was that the one that had um, the group that focused on the negative experiences or just received the counseling and didn't do any writing activity was so different in comparison to the group that wrote the gratitude letters. And the one that wrote the gratitude letters reported a significant better mental health four weeks and 12 weeks after writing their exercise, uh, after their writing exercise. So the important thing about the gratitude practice to take away is that you have to be patient with the results. You're not going to feel a dramatic increase or significant increase right away, but it does play out in longevity of, of your lifetime. Um, the impact is so crucial, so crucial. It does help with some negative emotions um, and you don't have to share it all the time. You could still have a practice of gratitude and just write to yourself. So that's just something I wanted to surface here because I think you pointing that out really does play a role and a hand in all the other work that we're talking about doing here on self. But I would say that that's the mother of all other virtues is the foundation yeah. of gratitude and appreciation. And then that's why I start ablaze with appreciation. I truly believe that one of the biggest challenges we face as we age is the battle against cynicism of negativity. Mm -hmm. And I thought about it. I said, one thing I love is to be around happy old people. Why is that? Because they're so rare. You know, you mm -hmm. have the stereotype of the grumpy old man or, you know, the, the cranky old lady, you know, and you say, well, well, why is that? And it's understandable. They have a lot of years that they've lived. They probably don't feel as well physically as they used to. And think about the number of things that can happen in life where you've been backstabbed and cheated and, and fired and, and injured and be treated unjustly, whatever it might be. And those nicks and cuts and scratches and breaks in our body, both physically and emotionally, psychologically, add up. And, and so you understand as we age, people have a tendency to be cynical. Plus we're in such a cynical world right now where I say, mm -hmm. no, the, what the passion for this book really comes to stand against that and going, no, at least I'm going to put a stake in the ground and say, despite the things that are going on in my life, despite the things that are going on in our world, in our workplace, in our communities and neighbors where we're fighting against each other, no. No, because you know what? This still is a great country. We have freedom, you know, and we have mm -hmm. opportunity. And so it's what we look for. It's the A of appreciation and the E in expectation. And so I think you can hear my passion is that this is so critical. I love that research and that study you cited because we need you and I, we need to continue to, to hit this message to the greater world of saying, I know. It, is there unjust? Is there racism in society? Are there people treating each other horribly? Absolutely. Okay. But there's also a lot of beauty in the world. And there's a lot of people that are out doing great things and transformational things for individuals, for neighborhoods, for communities, for societies that never get reported. And so that's what's so critical. So thank you for highlighting that because it is, it's mm. foundational. Yeah, Absolutely. And for anyone who's interested in getting more um, of this information and uh, to learn more about Tim and his services, I am dropping all of the good information in the show notes. So be sure to check that out. Make sure you're clicking on his link to his book. His book is outlining a lot of what you're talking about today, but not all of it. I mean, you are keeping some things to yourself. I right. think you had said about you know a majority of the book was focused on that M5, which is maintain. Um, that step in the self-discovery process. And we want to make sure that we are um, doing this work, then you want to get yourself that book. And so I do have to wrap up here today, but you and I could talk for hours. And as you mentioned, like it is so important that we're delivering this message. So I'd love to have you back for a second episode. But the last question that I have for you, no surprise to those who are frequent listeners, is what is your most recent paradigm shift? It's to expect the unexpected. I, mm. and, and I talk about expectation and I loved, mm -hmm. I was just, I was so excited when you said external locus of control, 
Because I ask Ooh. people all the time, do you have an internal locus of control or an external locus of control? I, I ask people that all the time. And an internal <laughs> locus of control is one where I go, you know what, circumstances and situations in life, I think I can impact those to the positive, that I've got some element of control over that. And, and I'm passionate about that. However, sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes things come my way that I don't want. I was never expecting that. To expect the unexpected. And there are elements in my life where I go, I, I have no idea. Keisha, I would love to tell you that I am as, I'm much smarter today than I was back when I was in my early 20s. The older I get, the stupider I realize I am. Because I go, there are some things that are truly unexplainable. And you know, I will not know until I get on the other side of why this happened or this type of thing. On the positive side of it, all right, there's some negative elements to that. But on the positive side, I'll go back to pickleball again, just as an example. I'm going totally unexpected. I had no plan, no interest in, in heading down again. I, I used to make fun of the sport. Well, now I've got some instructional videos out. One of them is is approaching, I think it may have just passed, a quarter million views. And I'm going, and I'm having people that are sending me emails saying, hey, I'm thinking about flying in and taking lessons from you and that type of thing. I'm going, me? Really? I, I had no idea. I was about the book and going on a speaking tour and doing podcasts. And now um, I'm leaning into this. Pivoting. I'm pivoting. Mm-hmm. And the reason why? It still fits into my personal mission and purpose statement. And so it all kind of ties yeah. together. And just let, one last point on the book is that, yes, we've talked about a lot and a lot of elements, but the way the book is written, you can hop into any one of those M's in the M5 method of self-discovery. So it's really can be used. You can read it front to back, but you can also use it as a workbook as well. Oh, I love that. I'm a big fan of that. Um, one of my flaws is being able not able to read a book from front to back so that definitely aligns with me what I'll do is I put them on my bookshelf and I'll I'll open it up to a random page and read through that chapter me too you know 20 pages for example that's kind of the way I do it um but I love I love your paradigm shift that you've shared with us today and all this amazing knowledge coming from your book but that paradigm shift around expect the unexpected is so, so helpful. I mean, we cling to expectation and we cling to outcomes all the time. And if we just let go and practice the art of detachment a little bit, we yes. might be just surprised on what actually happens and how life plays out for us. And it might actually be bigger and better than we even imagined in the beginning. So um, thank you for sharing that. Oh, well, thank you for having me. This has been a pleasure. Yes, we could talk for hours. I need to have you on my podcast as well. So we'll we'll get together again very soon. This is I, I truly enjoyed it and I love the work that you're doing. Thank you. Likewise. Thank you so much for tuning into this week's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, don't forget to leave a review, rate, and subscribe wherever you're listening. If you know a business leader in practice or friend who you think would be interested in this episode, please consider sharing it with them. I am so grateful for your support. For more updates, you can follow us at Paradigm Shifts Podcast on Instagram. See you on the next episode.